Hello everybody, welcome back to the channel. Now this week's episode is with a gentleman named Kevin Jay. He's a comedian whose work I've admired and enjoyed through the years, particularly his Netflix special. Itself quite an achievement because it's an accolade that not many Malaysian comedians can lay claim to. Now see, I think a lot of people don't realise the value that comedians bring to society. Because I come from the media world, and in, the, in my world, every year that goes by, uh, my industry shrinks more and more thanks to digital disruption and economic difficulties. So what remains as society's so-called conscience are the last few remaining true journalists and a few comedians where our work has really been to try and tell the true story, the true events as they unfold about this country of ours. But unlike journalists, uh, comedians have a tragicomic element to their uh, work where uh, Malaysia's missteps and uh, mistakes and, and so on and so forth are told and enjoyed and laughed at and cried at in equal measure by the Malaysian public. But at the same time, they also bring to light what is good and proper about our country and our people. So I think that comedy must be protected. They must be allowed to thrive and prosper at all costs because without them, we lose another leg of humanity in this so-called relentless drive for progress. As always, if you can, like the video, comment and tell me what you think. Subscribe to the channel because it's always a great help if you can do so. And so, dear viewers, without further ado, may I now present Kevin J. Okay man, Kevin J, uh, comedian, thank you for doing this. You're welcome. Um, obviously, I've known about you for a long time, a reasonable okay. amount of time because uh, I, I came across your, your Netflix special, so we'll right. talk about that in a little while. Uh, then I heard you on Fly FM, and I thought you were really good, really natural. Thank you. Um, but I, th I think the main reason for me in, in talking to people like you, comedians, right, mm -hmm. is the fact that um, we live in a world where information and news is coming to us with a lot of like um, compromises and biases, right? Correct. To me, the last bastion of truth, or one of the few last bastions of truth, are mm -hmm. comedians. Because you take on information, you process it, you tell it in a very real and very honest, and sometimes... Um, farcical, not farcical, um, parody-like, or okay. you try and put a spin in it, so it's it's less jarring and less insulting to people, but it happens nonetheless. Correct. So then we talked about this on the phone before you agreed to do this in person, and then I was switched on to your podcast, the Macha Man podcast, really good, Spotify, you can get it, and you, you do a lot of research, you look oh, into yeah. things like um, MH370, the Mona Fendi case, uh, Chin. Obviously, I haven't listened to everything, yeah, yeah. But you spent a lot of time in research, so so maybe maybe we talk about how you got stuck into this game as well, because you've been in the game a long time. Yes. In, at a time when maybe com comedy wasn't so mainstream in Malaysia, so 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 how how did you fall into it? I um well, I've been doing it for sixteen years now. Two thousand six, I think. Uh, I I think it all started when I was like seventeen years old, when I moved when I moved to the UK la. Because before that, I have not heard of this stand-up comedy nonsense, right? Because clearly, we as Asians, lah, we only have like four career choices, right? Doctor, lawyer, engineer, disappointment, and so <laughs> you know. So basically, I was always going to be an engineer, lah, I guess. You know, because that's the easiest one. Doctor, oh, lawyer, doctor very la, difficult. Right, but yeah. No, doctor, lawyer, very difficult. Yeah, Engineering, yeah. at least, at least you know, got hope. You know. Lawyer, lawyer. Lawyer cannot. Uh, too many, too much reading. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, I did become an engineer, and I went to the UK to study engineering. Uh, the problem was that I wasn't. It was I. I wouldn't say that I wasn't interested in engineering. I loved engineering. I, I loved the fact that we created things, we fixed things that were spoiled. You know, I loved that technical knowledge I had. Uh, so I I love that I love when I was when I was a kid I used to take apart toys and my parents used to get so angry at me because I used to take apart and try to put it back together again and always have one screw here and then the the, the robot don't work properly anymore <laughs> right so I I did that but when I went there that's when I got introduced to this art form of stand up comedy and. It really took me in la. I mean, I, I didn't want to perform comedy, but I loved watching comedy. I loved watching people do this, right? And so when I was there, I used to go to comedy clubs all the time and, you know, kind of... Whenever I got extra money la, you know, it, because it's expensive tickets and stuff. So whenever I had extra money, I always want to go to the comedy club, you know, chill out for a bit, 
uh, watch a show and then come home and I feel good about myself. I, I loved how it made me feel, right? Because it was one of those things. And then when I came back to Malaysia, I realized that I couldn't do this because there was only two comedians at that time or three, right? Uh, there was Harith Iskandar, Joanne Kam and sometimes Jit Murad. Right? So that was it. And I had to wait for them to do a show before I can go and do, uh, where I can go and see a show. So I felt like maybe I should do it. Lah. You know, how hard can it be? It's, uh, you get on stage, you start talking, how hard can it be, right? So then I, I but I, it was always a thing where I told myself, ah, yeah, tomorrow, yeah, now too busy, I cannot. tomorrow, lah, tomorrow. And it was a few years before uh, I actually started because actually my brother, who was kind of like an inspiration to me. Uh. He, he's always the funny one. He's always the popular one. And he always said, hey, you should do this stand-up comedy thing. Maybe, you know, there's something of your calling. Then he passed away, right? So, yeah, at, at 29, he had a heart what attack. What happened? Shit. Yeah, so it, it was very sudden. Like, nobody knew because everybody thought like, oh, you know, 30, then only you start doing your medical checkup, right? Yeah, so two weeks before his 30th birthday, that's when he had a heart attack. A was, massive he a, was he like ill? Was he a smoker, a drinker? Was he overweight? No. He was everything. Okay, so stress also and all that. Yeah, I guess. La. Everything la. Yeah, yeah, so I guess he didn't lead a very healthy lifestyle, obviously. But, uh, you know, he did smoke, drink and overweight. Uh, he, actually, his weight fluctuates. La. You know, he's like yeah. Seth Rogen. Right? So sometimes, yeah, yeah, he's yeah. like Oprah. La. Correct, sometimes correct. fat, sometimes thin. <laughs> <laughs> but... I guess it, it caught up to him. Been, yeah, anyway. Yeah. Yeah, it, no, no, she got she got yeah, phases yeah. one. You you see the show, uh, over the over the years, right? Yeah, you yeah, can yeah. see hey, wait, wait, wait. <laughs> like you can see like what what is this? Like a graph like that. <laughs> <laughs> so she uh so yeah, I mean yeah. I, I guess it caught up with him like. And then when he died, I thought to myself like, oh no, like life's too short, lah. Fuck, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah you right, can't right. you can't wait for things to happen or you can't say tomorrow anymore. So in fact the same year he passed away in June that August, I started comedy, right? Uh, 2006. I remember I, I got 150 of my friends, put them in a pub and tried to tell jokes. Uh, I failed miserably because I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't know what comedy was. In fact, before just before I went up, uh, I had watched uh, Eddie Murphy's uh, specials, Raw and Delirious, and I thought to myself... He was a fucking legend, man. He was a legend. He was... I mean, look, he was hilarious, right? Hilarious. And hilarious. he was young at the time. He was like maybe 20, 21. Yeah. This is like pre-Beverly Hills Cop. And oh, yeah. It was like, he was so good. Exactly. He was so good. So good. Talented, right? Yeah, but the problem was that I took the wrong message from that. Because when I watched that, that, that special, I thought that if I said... Obvious. If I swore enough, yeah. it would be funny. No. Yeah, that's the thing. I didn't know. Yeah. Like, you know, this is the first time. Just imagine, like, you don't know what comedy is. I push you on stage and say, go and do comedy, right? And that, I thought to myself, like, the wrong... I took the wrong message, right? I didn't figure out how he was telling a joke. I didn't how I didn't figure out how he was, like, constructing material or how he made people laugh. For me, it was like, oh, he said the word fuck a lot. Yeah. Oh, that must be it. That yeah. That's the secret. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Because after that, I saw uh, George Carlin... And all that. Also, they also swear Carlin, a lot. Carlin, Carlin was one of the forerunners, man. Exactly. He, he's, he's a legend, man. Richard Pryor. Richard Pryor. Also yeah. a lot of swearing. So yeah. I thought, okay, when I put all three together, I thought to myself, correct, huh? that's the word. That's yeah. the comedy part. So I just went up there, I just I just swore a lot. And my friends and uh, family, they were laughing sympathetically. Hmm. You know, you know you can... You know the la ha 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 ha. What's he doing? Why why is he doing? Ha 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 ha. Well done, well done. Right? You know, so like you know, it's like when you're, like you you know when your auntie say, hey, dance for the audience yeah, and yeah, the people yeah. so like a bit awkward ah. So that was what it was, and I could feel it. Right? I di- I didn't feel the fulfillment. Yeah. How old were you then? I was twenty six. Okay lah, you're paying uh, the dues, right? Twenty six to thirty, thirty one, five years typically, right? To pay tuition. Yes. A lot, a lot of people don't realize that that comedy is a science. You know, there's an art. It's an art to it. Right? Yes. And there's categories of comedy. Correct. Like you've got your surrealists, like mm-hmm. Eddie Izzard, right? Mm-hmm. You've got your realists, like Michael McIntyre. Correct. You've got your racial profiling, like um, Jimmy O Yang and Russell Peters Russell and Peters, people yeah. like that, right? And then you've got your intellectuals, right? So. I think Jim Eddie Izzard will fall a bit like into intellectuals as well. Yeah, I think I think Jim Jeffries was. Jim Jeffries. So so Jim Jeffries is profanities and and racism. Yes, but and, his and, his and, comedy uh, genre would be 
uh, intellectually as well, intellectuals. Yeah. Because I think that he he creates an idea. Yeah. And he justifies that idea. So I, I think that the best intellectual com- comedian out there is mm. someone like um, R- Ricky Gervais, right? He's yes. very intelligent yes. and very, very well thought through. Mm-hmm. But then in, in telling his comedy, he's very funny at the same time. Exactly. I think uh, another example of that would be Bill Burr. Bill Burr, yeah. Who basically, again, gives you an idea, yeah. justifies that idea and makes sense. Uh, if you do it in real life, you get beaten up. So, <laughs> exactly. Right. Yeah, right. So, I mean, the thing is, it gives you. It give, I mean, the mic gives you a lot of power, la. I mean, it took it took me a while to figure out what kind of comedian I was, and what kind of comedy I do, uh, stuff like that. I, it, it's it. I always say, la, comedy is art, right? Yeah. And art cannot survive without structure. Structure cannot survive without art, right? Because if you if you look at a building. You think it's all structured? No, there's art as well. Like you know, basically, it has to be nice to look at. Yeah. You can't just build a building, a box, and then say, "Oh, you live in it." Yeah. Right. So it yeah. has to be nice. That's, that, which is why structure cannot survive without art, and art cannot survive without structure because if art doesn't have structure, it will crumble. Correct. Right. Right. So basically, that and that's how it works. That's the thing. So we always have to learn the basics of stand-up comedy, where you know you need to know what to do, the rules, the regulation, and the thing is. Learning the rules doesn't mean you follow the rules because you have to learn the rules to break the rules. Yeah. Right. And the more you break the rules, the more art comes in. Yeah. So the thing is, but you still need to know the rules before you break it, lah. You can't. You can't just simply go up there and say, "I want to break the rules." But what's the rules? Don't know. Right. So, so art like comedy, like art, art is always of the times, right? Yes. Of, of the of that era, of mm. that period. So, so, so I I think a lot of Malaysian comedians in the past have always reflected the politics of the country. Yes, which is very domestic, which mm. is sometimes well, it is very narrow, and the comedians who go global are the ones who can transcend those uh, national borders, lah. Like yes. like for, like say for example, Joe Coy. Mm. Joe Coy doesn't talk about about America. He talks about his mum and his growing up years, yes. and like even Eddie Murphy in those days, his mum mm. trained the shoe like yes, boomerang yes, and yes, you yes. know the ice cream truck and yeah, Mr. Yeah. T and all that. So a lot of like general global culture pop parody, right? Yes. So that that travels. So today's era in Malaysia, right? Um, I I don't I don't know whether we have a comedian that really travels, maybe one or two, but but they're not big globally, lah. Right? Oh no, okay. I mean, um, if yeah. you if you count Ronnie Chang as Malaysian, lah. I mean, Ronnie is... Chang Ronnie Chang was was in a way spot because he moved to the US. Yes. Then he he lucked out with Trevor Noah and he's got his little skit there, and then and then he built from there, right? Yeah, lah. So I he, mean, he was lucky, lucky, lucky. I guess I guess good. you can call good. yes you can call it luck you can call it I I I believe is is with with Ronnie he's he's very hard working and I think he deserves everything But that's a luck. given right if you yeah, yeah No but the thing is okay like look for me I I probably I would say and I don't know this for for a fact but I would say that I'm the most traveled comedian in Malaysia I've done about what close to 40 cities worldwide Uh, I've been to Zimbabwe, South Africa, uh, doing comedy. You know, Finland, Myanmar. You know, places that you would never think comedy exists. But yeah, yeah I've done. I've done those places, and it's it, it's one of those things where I I learn very quickly that comedy is very universal, and as much as you think that you know that that. That very local joke will not work outside. Mm-hmm. Does sometimes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, all it takes is comedy is about context, yeah. right? So basically, as long as you understand where that person is coming from, like yeah. you, you, you gave a good, very good example in Joe Coy. Now Joe Coy does a lot of jokes about his Filipino mum, yeah. right? In America, yeah. now yeah. Fil- the Filipino population in America is very small, yeah. right? But it relates to people because everybody actually has the same. Has experience. a bit of a screwy mum, right? Yeah yeah, 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 and it's all about it's all about the fact that all he did was give a context about how Filipino mums are. Yeah. He does a a little bit about uh, Filipino stereotypes and how tiger mum it is. So people now take that on face value and basically accept the jokes based on this context. Yeah. Right. So that's all you need to do context. I I learned this when I was in uh, India. Actually, my first ever uh, overseas gig up. Uh, You take Singapore out of the equation, lah. Singapore is pretty much a local gig, but I went to Mumbai for the Mumbai Comedy Festival. Now I went with Harith, Harith Iskandar. I was supposed to open for Harith, but what happened was there was a last minute shuffle, and then I had opened for this Australian comic, and another Indian uh, newbie was opening for Harith. 
right? So I, for the, we were there for three, three, three days. We were doing three shows. So the first two shows, I did okay, but I was struggling a bit with, you know, kind of uh, figuring out what I can and cannot do. And I was trying to localize the jokes. I was trying to make sure that my jokes could travel and which yeah. jokes can I can actually do. Yeah. So it was it was a struggle for me, but I did okay, right? The Australian comic after me dies for forty minutes, but that's a different story. Wow! Right? Because Shit. no, he was he was a surrealist, okay. and I think India was not ready for that kind of comedy yeah, at yeah, that no. point. Yeah, and yeah. so he was really dark, and this thing, and everybody was like, "What's okay, going on?" <laughs> like, <laughs> like you know. And so yeah, but that a whole different story, right? So okay, yeah, go go. Yeah, yeah. so the, so, yeah. but on the third night, Harith was performing after me in the in a very near venue so I went to see watch him and Harith was murdering the crowd like he was doing so well and what jokes was he doing he was doing the same Malaysian jokes that you see him do in Malaysia like the CSI joke right you know the, the CSI was like, eh, mati, eh, mati. like he was <laughs> even saying the word mati and people were laughing right in India yeah. they were not Malaysians they were all Indians Right. So they'll become. But the thing is, he, Harith has got a funny face. So he looks funny. The fact that he does something funny, it's like humorous already. Yes. And you look funny, right? I. Um, <laughs> you know, but like my can, wife would uh, beg to differ. But <laughs> <laughs> no. But basically, I after the show, I asked him. I sat him down. Right. And I said, Hey, why, why, why are people laughing at your your Malaysian jokes? And he, he, his, his comment was very simple. It was basically context. I gave them context in the beginning. Basically, what is Malaysia like? Set it up. Set it up. Yeah. Now, if I tell anything about Malaysia, they will use this as a guide to just connect the jo- dots, right? So, so give an example, right? When you're in Norway or, or Myanmar, right? Mm-hmm. How much work do you have to do to... to, to... Actually, not that much. Yeah. I mean, like, okay, in my even my Netflix, right? It was very well received in the US, UK and all that. And a lot of my jokes were about... Okay, the first half of my, my this thing was about Singapore, right? Or making fun of Singapore. And the thing was... People don't understand the the relationship of Malaysia and Singapore, yeah. right? But it's very simple. I just gave them a context joke, which was basically Singapore and Malaysia relationship is like, you know, India and Pakistan. It's like England and France. It's like America and the rest of the world. So, you know, <laughs> if it, it's a joke. Everybody understands it's this thing. Yeah. And then I go further by the, 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 the relationship by saying in India and Pakistan, right, they were cousins, they grew up together, they were family. Right, and then Pakistan left, and then came back with an AK forty-seven. Right, everybody's like, calm down. <laughs> and then Malaysia and Singapore, same thing. We are family. We grew up together. And then Singapore left, and then came back with a BMW. Right, so everybody jealous. <laughs> like what we got, proton. Right, so so that was the context yeah, joke. So yeah. everybody knew yeah. that okay. So there is it's a neighboring country. Right, one, two. There is animosity between the two. Three, Singapore is richer than Malaysia, and that's why we are jealous. Right, so then I, then I, then I can do jokes like you know, oh, Singapore think they are, they are better than us. So event they, they can, they can very easily join the dots because the context is there. So this Netflix thing, right? Mm-hmm. To, to me, it was a big because anytime, anytime someone local scores a Netflix gig, yeah, it, it means that there's somebody already lah. Yeah, so yeah, I think um, Malaysian comedians, I can't remember. I think Jason Leong, has Jason Leong, Harith Iskandar, Harith and Iskandar, me. and yeah, three. Yeah. So so I'm quite puzzled because when it's like uh, when Chappelle gets a Netflix, he he mints it, right? Of course, fifty billion. He, yeah. 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 So so I'm I'm like I don't know. About I didn't Malaysia, get fifty million lah. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, but how how do they? So do, do they pay you for the special? Is that upfront fee? Yes. And how do they monetize? Okay. And so because is that like a partnership on mine, revenue and downloads. Mine and Jason's are very different because Jason produced his own Netflix special and then sold it to Netflix. Mine was a Netflix production. So they paid you to produce and no, yeah. they they paid someone else to produce. Obviously, uh, they don't have a production, but yeah. they themselves created. This, this thing they paid me a performance fee to come and perform okay and so which it. is the most lucrative one lucrative I would say I mean it depends on how you sell it lah. Uh, but I don't think either of us out like made but enough it's, it's, or more money but I guess you know, because you see what Jason did was he, he spent his own money mm. to mm, shoot produce yeah. edit everything yeah, yeah. and then just basically go to Netflix and go like here you go yeah, right. it's like Chappelle but his old one yes he's yes like, <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> Correct lah. Thanks, 30 million, yeah, whatever. For me, it, because it was a Netflix original, so they did everything, they did all that. I just showed up, performed and left. Right, so they did the lighting, they did the sound, they did everything. So, 
either way also it's the same lah I would say but I mean I, I just have the slight bragging right of oh mine's a Netflix original yeah, yeah right yeah. just and, that and it says at the start Netflix yes, original yes right? yes so I that small bragging right lah but at the end of the day do people care no it's the same thing you're on Netflix ah great yeah and mine kind of happened really uh, by being at the right place at the right time to be honest uh, I there was no inkling that from anyone that I would get uh, a Netflix special at all like basically what happened was I I was helping Harith on his Netflix special and uh, we we were just you know kind of goofing around and stuff like that and uh, I had gone to Edinburgh Festival and he was supposed to shoot his uh, special on like I can't remember the date but it was supposed to be the date that I was still there so I was supposed to come two three days later so I told Harith like I uh, can't make it uh, you know I, I wish you the best yeah. but then I thought to myself you know this is a historic time for Malaysia because the first ever oh he was the first one right he was the first yeah, one yeah. yeah and it's it's Malaysia Netflix and I can't I can't not do I can't not come lah. so I, I called Harith and I said you know what I, I will I'll buy new tickets it's fine I'll come back for your special Right, because it's a really proud moment for everybody. Yeah. Yeah, right, yeah. so I said, you know, I'll I'll come back. He said, okay, good. So I I flew back the night before. Right, the night before the special, I flew back, and I went straight to the hall, where he was supposed to record, and I and I walked in and I went, ah, you know, Harith, good luck, and he said, hey, good luck to you too. I'm like, what what are you talking about? He said, oh yeah, I forgot to tell you, you are warming up the audience. Oh shit. Yeah. Oh shit! The so fuck? I'm like, bro, this this information would have been helpful, ah, <laughs> uh, three so days went, ago. You went on that call. Yeah, kinda. Wow. So, but no, but the thing, I had time to prepare, But I, I guess as a warm up, I wasn't in front of camera, so I did, didn't really. And I used to do warm up for him before as well, so I know his audience quite well. I know how to, like, I know how to do warm up, lah. I just do ten minutes only. So I went up uh, just before he. I was very nervous. It was a lot of people. He did two shoots, by the way. How many people? Where and where was it? Uh, it was in. Uh, do you know HGH? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah uh, so Sintol there. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So he did the smaller one, and it was full. Two, two. I think it was thousand people. Shit. Yeah. So it was full. So he did two two shows. So one the uh, one early evening, one later evening, right? So the first time I went up there, I did my ten minutes. I warmed up the crowd. Did very well. Uh, you know, brought Harith up, everything, you know, big, big production, boom, bam, boom, bam, everybody happy, right? That was the first shoot. And then uh, the, the the director came up to me and said, hey, Kavin, can you do me a favor? Can you do a different 10 minutes? Oh, in the yeah. afternoon? In, in, in the yeah. second one. Yeah. I'm like, hey, you know, I felt like, oh, they didn't like what I uh-huh. did. Or, yeah. Okay, I said, okay, can, can. So I, I went up there, the second one, I did different material, mm. right? 10 minutes. Also did well. I thought I thought I did well lah, you know, did well blah blah, blah. and then brought up Hari Hari go hey, great show right. Then, like the director comes up to me and says, okay, director uh, is what Masale guy or uh, Australian, okay, okay Michael McKay. Okay. So he came up to me and said, hey, uh, do me a favor. By the way, then he introduced me to the people from Netflix and everything blah blah, blah everything. I said like, hello hello hello, and then they were like, hey, you, you did really well. I was like, oh thank God lah, there's there's some gratification there. So I was like, ah, oh, thank you, thank you. And then they, then uh, Michael just looks at me and goes, uh, keep next week free. I need to meet you, right? I was like, okay. Then you uh, said, like, thought, okay, what yeah lah. Like, like, I still so right? don't know. Like, maybe maybe I get to do a small part or somewhere or something. And then uh, he said, okay, so so I go I go to Singapore. I meet, uh, I meet with Michael had coffee, and then he just sat down. He's like, "Oh, so how is your this date looking?" So I I looked at my calendar. I was like, "I think I, I mean, I got a few things lah." But you tell me what maybe I can I can move dates around. Then he said, "Uh, we would like to shoot your special." I'm like, "What?" He said, "Yeah, we would like to shoot your special." I'm like, "What? Like a full special?" He said, "Yeah. Do you have an hour?" I'm like, "Yeah." Of course. Yeah, they were like, "Yeah, we'd like to shoot your special," and it was two months from the date that we talked about and I'm just like I mean of course I played it cool I'm like nah, yeah maybe I can move <laughs> things around yeah sure and then when he left I just sat there for I, I, I maybe, remember maybe shocked, right? With, yeah hell, I remember right? just like I couldn't believe what I was hearing and I, I just sat in the roadside curb in Singapore 
for like an hour. Did, did did they talk about details like how much you're gonna get and you know what kind of? I didn't care. Maybe they did. I, I care, at so that time I care, shut yeah. down already. Right. Uh, I I just sat there for how like an hour and I just went like, I can't believe this is so happening. So on the evidence of that morning and the afternoon, they thought, okay, this guy is interesting. Yes. Maybe did a bit of research. Okay, he's got this. Is it? Mm. Okay, let's do it. Yeah. Basically, uh, later on, I found out from Michael as well that they, what happened was they had budget for three specials. Right. So from they, Malaysia lah. For, no, uh, they were had budget for three. As in, one was Harith, one was Fakafas from Singapore, and they had budget for one more. But this bu- this one is a smaller budget, so I had to kind of share the production with someone, and stuff like that. But they had already had went through a few comedians, and they found it unsuitable. But having seen me perform at Harith's opening. The guys from the people from Netflix agreed that maybe this is the one. This fella lah, you uh, lah. So, so that's when they started talking. Hey, maybe we put this fella. So basically, being in the right place at the right time lah. If I wasn't, if you hadn't decided, if I to haven't go, decided yeah. to come back from Edinburgh early, yeah, I wouldn't know. I would not be sitting here with you lah. Probably yeah. be you know somewhere. But sometimes you know else. people say you know, things happen for a reason. Exactly. And in a way, your life is fated. Nah, 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 yes. Right? Um, but when when they assess wh- whether a comedian makes it makes the cut or not, mm-hmm. what kind of what kind of criteria? Is I it because know. of the human travels, or he, otherwise the comedian is too narrow or too parochial? You know? I think I think they were looking for that as well. A little bit of everything, like I think a little bit of uh, material that works everywhere. Yeah. A little bit of uh, you know the fact that I think they were looking for a certain type of comedian, who they were thinking wanted to do a certain way. Like they, they, fig- they. I think what they wanted was a comedian who, who was, fast paced, mm. you know, kind of this thing. That's what they wanted, lah. Yeah, I think, yeah. uh, which is why, they got, like Harith was, for one reason, he was the biggest comedian in Malaysia at that time, yeah. right? Uh, so by virtue of his just fame. Yes, yeah. yes, virtue of fame. I think I'm. I'm not taking anything away. Do they away. share data with you? Like how many downloads? No, of you? course not. Oh, Never. Do nah, nothing. Oh, so you're one and done. That's it. Yeah, that's it. That's it. Oh that's shit. It, yeah. So you're paid. That's it. That's it. So ongoing relationship don't have like part two. No, part no. Three. Of course, of course. I still know who who these people are. They know who I am. So is there like an idea that okay, in a couple of years we can do a fresher update? You know? No, no. no, no. I mean, the thing is, you can't. I have, like, I'm. I'm very sure uh, Harith and uh, uh, sorry, Jason has the same thing as well. You have direct contact with them. You yeah. can call them up and say, hey, I got this idea. They will listen to you, but. The problem is, is all depends on budget and how much they want to spend and stuff like that. Yeah, so yeah. I've I've pitched to them so many things, but at the end of the day, they they never took it up because, uh, they, they it's a policy issue in Netflix Malaysia as well, where you know they only can buy IPs and it's a budget issue as well because they need to you know yeah. pull out budgets from here yeah. and there. So they want it's very difficult uh, That's why there's not not been a special coming out ever since, right? Mm. Even. Uh, even Jason's one was because they were kind of a little bit desperate during the pandemic to kind of have a thing. In fact, they call they call a few com- comics. They call me also. Like, do you have anything? Yeah. I was like, I wish I did because yeah. I didn't. Uh, but Just Jason had. Just say you have lah. Then at least. No, cannot because I needed something to shoot. I, we couldn't go out at that time. It was pandemic yeah, yeah. It was MCO. We couldn't go out and shoot anything. So, the problem was that Jason had shot his two years ago. So he just so he, it off lah. Yes, that actually <laughs> basically what he did. Yeah, right? Yeah. So for me, I didn't have that. I had, I had, but it was not quality good enough. So what's your process? Because I mean, I, I, I listened to a lot of Joe Rogan's podcast, right? Mm. And he, his, his process is very, very long one, you know, like mm. um, he, he'll, he'll write the basic jokes when he's straight up and then he does, you know, he'll, he'll do a bit of alcohol or whatever. Mm-hmm. Then he'll add layers onto it. Then mm-hmm. he'll he'll spend like maybe six months in the smaller clubs and mm-hmm. stress test the jokes, right. and then after like nine months, then he's got a finished product. Right. And, and then, but then in the delivery of that, you know, those jokes, it's seamless because I see these guys, yeah. they don't um ah, they don't trip up. The timing is perfect. Gervais yeah. is the same thing. Mike and Ty is the same thing. Mm. So so these guys are so good and it's so seamless. You know what 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 about your process? My process is very different. I think uh, when you look at when you look at other comics in Malaysia, even some some comics write, yeah, right. They write a whole like the whole show. They memorize it and then they have the That's show. That's the other thing, right? How yeah. do you deliver a an hour's worth of content off the top of your? 
unless you've done it like a few hundred times already. I guess yeah, they they do they do they do yeah. they do practice rehearse and yeah. all that. Like one of my favorite comics, Kwa Jan Han. Like I love how he he writes. He he's his writing is just phenomenal. Where he this this guy. I know Kwa Jan Han. Yeah, yeah, you know right. Yeah. So he, the, he this is one a true story. He he didn't have a show. He he bought a ticket, went to Kazakhstan, I think, uh, and came back within an hour. Wow! Yeah, Shit. I, I I wish I can do that, right? So he's just observational, lah. He, he's observational, he's storytelling, and he's he is just. I, sometimes I feel so jealous because I feel I feel like I want to do that. I want to be able to just write, you know. But I I let me, like look. I grew up uh, with a learning disability. I have dyslexia. Right, so basically, for me, reading writing was a challenge. So I think it's like from here, you just deliver it from here. Yes. So, but that's why with with, with Jen, Jen Han actually helped me because well, after my after my Netflix, right? When my Netflix came out, remember I had two months to prepare, so I, you know, basically I did a best of in yeah. in yeah. in Netflix. Now I have no material left. Yeah. Right. So when Netflix came out, uh, I had to write a new hour for me to tour ma. So at that time. I had maybe six months to write an hour, which was more than enough time to be honest. But what happened was I could not write because I didn't understand my process. I didn't understand what I was doing, right? And three months in, I was going through depression already. Oh shit! And and you know honestly, a coming, no, right? I I know there's a timeline coming, and I'm forcing myself. And here's a here's a quote that I heard that I thought really made sense was, "Art is like a fart." Yeah. Right, yeah, it's gonna just come out naturally. No, <laughs> if you force it, it's probably shit. Yeah, right. So <laughs> it's gonna all show in a mess. Yes. So basically, like, and I called Jen Han and I uh, and I told him like, bro, how do you write? Can you please teach me? And he's he what he said to me was, why are you writing? This is not you. Yeah. You are a brilliant comic who goes on stage and works out material. As it is. As it is. You are you are an ideas guy. Yeah. Take your idea and work it out on stage. So like some of the Russell writing. Peters, right? Uh. I think Russell Peter, the fucker ad libs on it all the time. Yes. He'll go in there. Yes. He look at someone in the crowd. You know, there was one time he did this. That he, there was a couple in the crowd, mm-hmm. right? So this this Matsali woman, and then married to an Indian guy, right? And then they look quite stuffy. So he started to make fun of the Matsali woman. Then she, then he goes. You know, he likes to say, "Oh, so where are you from?" And then she's like, you know, prim and proper British woman. I'm mean, from Bedford. And so he starts making fun yes, of her. Yes, yes. Bedford, oh, England, oh. You know. no, so yeah. funny, so yes. funny. So for me... So you, are you like that, right? I'm like that, yes. I, I'm very good at crowd work, but I try to refrain from doing a lot work, of crowd work. Because yeah. uh, that's in a way cheating. Not cheating yeah, la, it, it not, I wouldn't say cheating. It's, it's, it's very good because it's, la, yeah. it's not an easy way out because not a lot of comics can do it. It's a skill that, you know, it's, it's a very acquired skill. But however... I try to give uh, material as well, like something I worked on. I worked on this thing. So for me, it's, it's a balance of the two, right? Yeah. But however, basically, th- th- that's when I realize that I need to have an idea of what I want to say. Go up on stage and kind of word it on stage, because as as I found out that my mind on ADHD and dyslexia is like it's on drugs, right? Because my I can think three sentences ahead. Wow. Because my mind, basically dyslexia is your mind, your brain works faster than your eyes. Yeah. So you are processing information faster than your eyes can take. Yeah. Right. So basically, when you're reading, your you, the words are jumbling up because your mind is already processing something that you haven't seen. Right. So basically, that's what's going on. So you got ADHD as well. I have ADHD as well. So how how does that manifest in work? Uh, in work for me, like I cannot concentrate lah, writing and stuff like that. I sit down, I get distracted very fast. Right, right. And uh, plus, on top of that, dyslexia for me, writing also a problem. So you know, it becomes a chore for me. I have to work extra hard for me to write. So to be honest with you, until today, I have not written down my jokes. Wow, <laughs> that's incredible. Even for the Netflix. Even for I mean, okay, Netflix, I did. Attempt to write it down, but those were jokes that already has been so done. So already muscle already. Like. Already muscle already. So basically, yeah. it was just a list of things I want to do, right? So basically, it wasn't this thing. I I I I mean, basically, if I show you my my joke list, like the last show that I did, which was one hour, twenty minutes, was just four words. <laughs> what were those four words? Those four words were, uh, introduction, weed, 
uh, <laughs> uh, coming in a bottle <laughs> and corporate. Okay, so expand on weed. Okay, no, basically it was okay. So the last special I did was called "I'm Sorry I Shouted." It was basically a show about my vulnerabilities, right? The the dual side of me. I'm angry, uh, but you know I don't want to be. But also the fact that in the pandemic, I realized that there was a lot of things that I've been through in my life that is quite embarrassing to talk about, right? For instance, I was deemed infertile by the doctors, which is very difficult because, uh, you know, it's very emasculating yeah. and it's very, you can't talk to your friends and family about this. Well, it depends on what kind of person you are. Yeah, right? I know, but it's... It's it's very difficult to for have guys. It is lah, right? Yeah, yeah especially yeah. for guys. That's yeah, yeah. that's my whole point, right? Yeah. You know, if you you a bunch of your friends and you buy them a beer and you go, hey, my balls not working, uh, my sperm cannot <laughs> work. Yeah, swim, yeah, and then and they also be looking like, hey, bro, did you <laughs> did you do something? Did, my did beer you or? did you what 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 are you trying to say? Right. <laughs> so for me, that was that was an issue, right? And I basically wrote that show because I wanted to tell people that look. Men should be able to talk about this. Talk shit. about, yeah. you know, be that friend. Yeah. In fact, we we I think people are willing to talk. Yeah. It's just that not many people are willing to listen, right? As men, as friends, especially yeah, your male like, friends. Yeah, you, like, you you start fuck. talking. You start talking about your problems, right? Ah, yeah, yeah. You girl, are you? What is this? You know, drink, ah, drink. What, <laughs> like, the, and it's not helping. Like, because I had a friend who actually uh, committed suicide in the during the pandemic and it was a very difficult time and I realised that only if he would have talked about his problem maybe we could have helped him yeah. and I look I'm not the problem is the blame is on me as being a good friend right because I we together as, as a society especially as men have a stigma of not talking about our problems yeah. Right. We, we when we when we hang out together, all we talk about is Liverpool, and Manchester United. And it's getting worse. Yes. It's getting worse because of political correctness. Yes. So the thing is, that's why I love comedy because comedy talks about everything, and there's almost no boundaries. Yeah. There are boundaries, but the boundaries are far in the bloody exactly. distance, right? So someone like Ricky Gervais, he, he's saying that nothing's off limits because if you talk about it, and then you go through it. And it makes you invincible because exactly. you, you can discuss it, right? Yeah. And even his mother's death and all that. Mm. Yeah, he'll talk about it. Exactly. And you know, at the end of the day, what are you? One in 4.3 trillion times chance of probability of making out as a human being. Exactly. Then here for a fucking split second, yeah. 60, 70, 80 years if you're lucky. Yeah. And then you're gone. Exactly. Why you get head up about all kinds of shit, right? No, which is why... So I, I, that's why I love comedy. Which is why I was very proud of my last special because I felt like it's something that I have evolved into rather than doing ha ha jokes 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 you know yeah. it, which is nice but the problem was this this special for me was not just ha ha right it was ha ha got downs got ups and it was a e- roller coaster of emotions because I take people through my anger through my frustrations through my sadness uh, like for instance I talk about having a miscarriage you know how it was very sad at that time and then I bring them up again to yeah. another, you know, frustrated to my, to my, to my uh, family who, you know, basically all they wanted was a child. Yeah. Like, you know, ever since the, the day I got married, like, when you're getting a baby, I'm like, we're still at the wedding. Can you wait? <laughs> yeah. Like, you know, it, it, that kind of thing. So basically it was frustrations, all, all emotions and it was very, I, I, I was very proud of it because I felt like there was an, there was a natural transcend, transcend to a different type of comedy. Instead of the usual, hey, look at me, I'm, you know, this is a funny thing, this is a funny thing. This, it's constant laughter, yeah. which yeah. I feel like I need to evolve to do more things. Instead yeah. of just, just making you laugh, I need to make you think, I need to make you learn, I need to make you, you know, kind of sad, I need to make you kind of happy, I need to kind of make you kind of angry and frustrated. So, yeah, these kind of emotions I really want to do rather than just laughter. Yeah, because there's a maturity to that humor yeah. already. There's a maturity to the comedy. You've graduated to the top exactly. ranks. And for me, the best example of that is someone like Chappelle, right? Um, Dave yes. Chappelle of the US. 
he is considered one of the doyens of American comedy. Yes. And he's in his, what, early 50s now, maybe late 40s. He's been around the block a few times. Uh. Yeah. He's had his crashes, he had his peaks, and now he's on the rise yes. again. And in telling the story, there's a lot of racism and, you know, anti-black stuff in America. His poverty, his, his drug use, and mm. he became a Muslim and da 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 yes, da right? Yes. Um, but in telling his story, you you get taken on that exactly like you that you take him on the right and a lot of it is funny yeah. because it's dark humor but it's human yes. nonetheless i mean and i mean you, some, you of dark, some of it's dark some of it's light yeah yeah i mean like another example that would be great for this would be mike Perpiglia. yeah i've not heard of him though you've not heard of him no. okay you have to he's he's a storyteller comedian and he's one of my favorites in the world the way he tells a story he brings you on this emotional ride and you can laugh and cry at the same time. It's just it, it's like one Richard of Pry Pryor used to make you laugh and cry at the same yes, time. Yes, but right? Richard Pryor was a little bit more rough. Yeah. Whereas Mike Birbiglia is so much more polished in the storytelling art, where he can he can basically his whole show for an hour is one story. Yeah. But it's jokes in between and yeah. it's tangents in between. But it's basically one story arc, and that's what I loved about Mike Birbiglia and. Uh, another Welsh comedian called Rod Gilbert, which is in any anywhere since 2006 until now. If you ask me who my favorite comedian is, is Rod Gilbert, and how he does that story arc of of being this frustrated person from one end to another. And so, it, so, so th there's a lot of self de deprecation as well. It's self deprecation, but also the fact that it's it's a it it's real life. Yeah, because and you I'm, can relate to it. Yes, because it's it's basically. A story about okay, like 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 Mike Birbiglia was the last special he did. Not uh, thank God for the jokes. It's on Netflix. Uh, he he tells a story about how his life changed from getting married, having a child, to you know basically going through that life lah. Yeah. And it's just one story, and it's very the way he tells the story is very soothing, very relaxing, and also he takes you through this this. This whole yeah, peaks and traps. Peaks yeah, and yeah. yeah, it's basically this roller coaster of emotions that you go through, and you you just feel good about yourself, and you relate well, to of him. How screwed up his life is? He, no, not that. <laughs> it's it's got nothing to do with how screwed up his life is. Yeah. It's just that you relate to this man. Yeah. You relate to this man through his stories, and you think to yourself, "This is me. This is who yeah, I am. This, this is what I've been through." Right? Yeah. And if you haven't been through the same thing, you could like, oh. This is what, how I would react if I went through yeah. this. It's very human story. It's yeah. very human story, and that kind of that as a comedian. Although I want to make people laugh, if I can make somebody cry, if I can make somebody feel feelings that a human can feel, for me, I've done my job. Yeah, I I want to do that. Yeah. I don't want to just have a one-dimensional joke, joke, ha ha, funny. I would like to have a more dimensions to the fact that. Hey, you know, I made you feel things that you usually don't feel. Yeah. Like for instance, one of my one one of the reviews that I got for my show was that the the journalist said that I didn't know there was this kind of comedy in Malaysia. It took me up high, it took me down low, and for me, when I read that, I was like, oh, you know. Yeah, and I feels... think that not every comedian can do that because I think Russell Peters hasn't been able to make the transition. Yes. I think I I I get the sense now mm. that he's reached this age. And he hasn't transitioned to the Chappelle level, whereas he should have. Well, yeah, fair and, enough. And a good example for me is, is also Uncle Roger. You know, Uncle Roger, the Nigel, rise yeah. thing. He, he's like, come on, how long are you going to beat that drum, right? I mean, I don't know the guy, don't get me wrong. Right? I, I know him personally, right. actually. I met yeah. him. I, you know, remember I said I, 2018, uh, 2017, I went to Edinburgh. That's where I met Nigel. And Nigel and I became friends. Yeah. And we did Comedy Central together just before yeah. uh, he the Uncle Roger character came out. And... I know this guy and he's one of the hardest working comedians. No, hard work is one thing. That's yeah. a given, right? But you also can have that character, mm. that talent to transition and keep going upwards. Yeah. I think Chappelle no, does it very that's, well. That's the right? problem. Uncle Roger was a character and but not his stand-up. But it's one-dimensional. Yes, it's very one-dimensional but it's a character of his stand-up. No, it's a character, not his stand-up. But the thing is, Uncle Roger is funnier than... Na so I'm really sorry, Nigel. I don't know... No, 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 no. I, I don't think he's watching. Come down. <laughs> <laughs> In case, right? So Uncle Roger is funnier than, than Nigel in person. That's that, that's a real problem. Yes, Don't it is. No, so? because, I, no, I I honestly feel like Nigel is a very funny comedian. I I, I like Nigel's comedy, and I I feel like you know this thing. And I the, the thing is my 
introduction to Nigel has been has predated Uncle Roger, right? I know that he did a lot of uh, character work on his videos to kind of you know get more noticed in in on on online obviously because that's how nowadays is basically social if you're viral on social media therefore you become a popular comedian right yeah, yeah. the problem was that he got viral by this character called uncle roger and that's what people want already yeah and that's a problem it's a problem it's a problem for him because now he when he do stand up he has to bring Uncle Roger with yeah. him. Like and he can't do just Nigel Ng because yeah. when he comes out as Nigel Ng, people get upset because yeah. people want to see Uncle Roger. Yeah. And at that point, for him, he has a dilemma because, like, I still have to do this shit. Yeah. But it's I like, want to do it, this. It, it's shit. like that actor. What is his name? Hemsworth, right? Who can only ever do Thor. Yeah. He's fucked now, right? Yeah. He said Jason Momoa can only ever be Aquaman. Yeah. And that's it, right? Yeah. It, yeah. There's no. There's like he was. I think the problem with the, with society now is that we're so social media crazy yeah, yeah. that that is the character we want and that's what we want. You have you you cannot be anything else. So you have it's an art. You've got to grow in your art. Yeah. Like um, if you used to paint in a certain way at twenty five, if you're still painting that certain way at thirty five, you've not graduated as an artist. So the, comedians are the same thing. It's a constantly re re. Um, refreshing process yeah. you got to shed your skin grow a new skin hopefully the, problem, the new skin is as good as the old skin the problem with Uncle Roger is I, I feel like can he like if let's say he drops it he drops the Uncle Roger character now he's screwed yeah he's screwed, he's screwed. Nobody, nobody will care anymore yeah. so that's why he still holds on to it and the thing is to be fair would I have done the same thing probably not yeah. I wouldn't have started this is a curse lah, right, in the yeah. way, right? I, I don't know maybe for me I wouldn't have done, let's say, Uncle Raju, yeah. right? I I would I would not have started that with that. This is because I I have again very different values from Nigel, and I I'm sure if you ask him, would he do it again? He probably would. Yeah, because he's brought him a lot of money. Yeah, I mean, yes. I wish I had that kind of money also, lah. <laughs> <laughs> you know and, what I mean? Yeah. So it's better to have one trick pony that minted it rather than. Having no trick, like, yeah. Tadpoles, right? Yeah, yeah. Like I, I don't have anything viral on social media, and so yeah, that's the other thing, right? Mm. A, a lot of like um, success nowadays comes from your channel, right? Your yeah. Instagram, your TikTok, your YouTube. Yeah. Um, what what holds people back from doing this? Because you're you're already in front of a screen. You're already in front of an audience. Is it the production? Is it no? The it's work? just I as a, as the a discipline? as a resident old person. Yeah. I don't understand social media. I really yeah. don't. And dude, you're like how much younger than me, lah. I know, but I'm. I also predate social media. I also predate. I remember having my first phone when I was, was when I eighteen. I had a three three one zero. Oh Nokia. Yeah. So basically, that was social media at the time, right? The worst, the best thing you can do on three three one zero is play snake, right? So. <laughs> Now everything is here, right? Because yeah. like we had to send our daughter to like the doctors because we had to surgically remove her phone from her hand. So <laughs> okay, that was a joke. <laughs> <laughs> no, I but almost took you literally. There. Yeah, yeah, I know, I know. That that uh, yeah, that that's a comedy thing, huh? Build you up and then drop it down. <laughs> so no, the thing is, everybody is like this now. So it it becomes part of life and. I don't understand what people want from social media. You see, for instance, we come from a time where if you have talent, you get noticed. Your surface, but now you can't. You can't play. Now, no, you got talent, so you, nobody cares about right. you. You can be the best singer in the world if you're not viral on social media. Nobody knows about Dude, you. Kuma from Singapore. Yes. Fucking hilarious, right? Transvestite humor is always fun. Mm. Like Eddie is it? Yeah. Eddie is it's, it's great because he's a guy that likes girls. Who then dresses up as a woman mm. who still likes girls, mm. but he says she's still a guy who likes yes. girls. So that's, that's genius, right? Yes. Kuma is a full blown tr- tranny, right? Uh, uh, no, not really, that. not really. I, okay, I don't know. He looks yeah. like it though. No, yeah. no, he he is a, a transvestite, as in the fact that he he dresses in women's clothes yeah. but on stage, right? Yeah, so in real, real life, he voice. doesn't. Yeah. But he does. Yeah, no. But in real life, it, it's a stage persona that he has. Yeah. But in everyday life, he doesn't really dress dress. Yeah. Or put on makeup or stuff like that. But he he, he is tailor made for, yes. for. But he doesn't have his own ch- channel. No, the thing is, he is viral though. He is viral, yeah. But not on his own channel. Correct. Like, so because he's not in control of the shots. No, he's not in control of what goes out, what comes in. But then again, you you have to understand that he does uh, like me doesn't understand social media and and the thing is, he's already out there, so let it be. And the thing is, either way, he's still he's still getting viral. So the problem is, artists are not usually businessmen. Right. Yes, 
Uh, like, like we need example, to hire like, social media guys. Yeah, like Ansel Adams, the very famous photographer, was also a very good businessman. Yes. So he made a lot of money when he was alive yes. with his shots. Ansel Adams, you know, landscape, right? Yeah, but artists here's are, the thing. There's a, lo- businessmen. there's a lot of very good businessmen who are so, so less than average artists artist. who also make a lot of money. Yeah. Now, that's the thing. Social media is like that. There's a lot, like I work on radio now. Right, and the thing is, a lot of our the songs that we play on radio nowadays is not songs that have sold enough albums. It's not so, uh, songs that are popular. It's songs that are viral on TikTok. If you what? are viral are you on serious? TikTok, it's a it's a song on radio now. Wow, that is insane, man. Yes, so basically, we we cut middlemen are being cut out by social media, which is a good thing. I think. Which is a good thing and a bad thing at the same time because at the end of the day. Any, 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 like sometimes uh, I feel like, okay, you know, this is a very personal point of mine, okay? But I feel like some of the songs that are viral on TikTok has a very good hook, but the rest of the song is it's not good. Happy, yeah. right? But the thing is, the because it's viral on TikTok, it becomes that. a song that you play on radio and yeah. it's the whole song, and sometimes you listen to it, you're like, yeah, what song is so this? So it's not technically perfect. Like, yeah. I, so, like, someone like Dua Lipa. Mm. is tailor-made for like TikTok because very very catchy very hooky yes but no, no but good. also the songs are very good la. okay la, but it's, it's, it's not yeah, I like it la. I like, I like la, good you know? yeah, yeah no okay fair. no Dua Lipa is a very good uh, singer I think she uh, this thing like for instance we would we would take for example Bella Porch yeah right Bella Porch is a TikTok uh, she was viral on TikTok yeah right and then she made a song and that song suddenly became uh, you know, became a song and, and it validated started, her, her yeah. fame. La. Yeah, but the song itself was not very technically good. Uh, I, I personally, I don't think it's a good song. Yeah. However, uh, other people might might differ. Uh, and I think that you know, technically, I think the song is very basic. But it became viral, and therefore she made millions of dollars from that song because yeah. it got played on radio. It got this, it got that. Everything, everything was there. So a bit like Uncle Roger la. A bit lah. <laughs> but however, when you look at it. Dua Lipa, however, is a very technically technically gifted singer. So? I think so. I think she can. Maybe it hides behind the. Maybe it's, it's disguised behind the poppy veneer, but... Yes. No. 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 But she can sing like that. That girl can really sing. Like if you give her a mic, she can. She can do a lot of stuff. Like Ariana Grande. Ariana Grande is is a good example of both yeah. social media yeah. uh, viral virality and also very good uh, vocal chords. So for someone like you, a comedian, mm. right? Yeah. Um, obviously, you there's a shelf life to art. Everybody knows that, right? Mm-hmm. This this piece, it's like to, to me now. Russell Peters, he's kind of lost his 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 sheen. Right. I used to love him 10, right, 15 right. years ago. Fantastic, but now it's like he he's lost a little bit of it. You know what I mean? Mm. Artists are like that. Like Casey Neistat on YouTube, he's one of the granddaddies okay. of of YouTube, right? Mm. But now the stuff he produces, it's like he he's missing something now. Mm. Sometimes it disappears, you know, and and yes. and that can be troublesome. I think you know what I mean. So yeah. So f- for for business purposes, for longevity, to make sure that you're f- you still have food on the table, you know, you got to crack the code and then somehow use the intellectual property, own it, you know, mm. own the catalog, and I, I, otherwise, I mean, you know, owning the catalog is basically for us is basically to record it and basically put it out lah. That's that's how we get to own. But what you're talking about is also. Evolution, yeah. As a you comic, you gotta keep evolving. Yeah, you gotta artist. keep evolving based on. Uh, one thing we are very lucky with in Malaysia is that the audience is evolving together with the comic, right? Because that's an assumption, right? No, it's not an assumption. It's actually fact. Because when we started, right, uh, as green as the comedians were, yeah, the audiences were green as well, right? So humor in those days, I remember Jit Murad and mm. Joanna Kapoor was just funny because she was just swearing and she was yes, very yes, she was all, all crass. Yeah, 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 she was. But that yeah. was what the audience wanted to hear at that and time. Is she now? Uh? She's still doing comedy. Really? Yes, yes. Wow. She she also has evolved and she's doing very very well now. Okay, uh, you, you see, the thing is with with Harith and and Joanne. I think when we came out in two thousand six and we had this revolution of comedy and we started. You know, evolving. Yeah. Yeah. I think it gave them a little bit of a kick in the backside because I, I, I'm very sure. Even Joanne has admitted, and even Harith has admitted that our emergence, kind of, basically biting at their heels, yeah. made them want to evolve a little bit so that they also. And what they did for 
for company at the time, mm. open the doors for yes, you guys. For us, right? yeah. Yes, definitely open the doors for us. And then what we have done by evolving into this comedy revolution, they also had to evolve to become more than what they were. Right? So you see, like for instance, like you, you use a very good example in Russell Peters. Russell Peters was the, the icon of comedy for Asia. Right? Because before Russell Peters in 2005, uh, when YouTube became a thing, it, before that was, Ed, like we spoke about, lah, Eddie Murphy, Richard Pryor, uh, Robin Williams, Carlin, Carlin uh, Bill Maher. All these people, if you notice, were white or black. right? And what they spoke about was the problems of white and black people. Yeah. Asians cannot relate. Yeah. Right? Until we, Russell Peters came Until along. Russell Peters came out and started talking about Chinese people, yeah. Indian people. Yeah. This, and suddenly now we Asians had something to relate to in comedy. Yeah. Immediately, we latched on to Russell Peters. And Russell Peters, I mean, he made a lot of money, obviously, but he also embraced that yeah. and did that. that. That was his shtick. Yeah. Right? So his was, I do Asian stereotypes. Right? All the other people do white stereotypes, black stereotypes, yeah. American stereotypes. Yeah. We Asians couldn't follow. So finding the category. So then in a way that opened the doors for people like Hassan Minaj, yes. Trevor Noah, yes. and Joe Coy and all that, right? Yes. And that's when, you, you forget about all these people. Lah. Okay, It opened the doors for multiple Asian comics in Asia. Because now Asian audiences are thinking, oh, there is comedy for Asian people, now there is a market. Yeah. You know, for, yet, forget about all these Hassan Minajes and all this. They already had a market. Correct. In, in, and it's still North yeah, America. It's right? still yeah. North America. They don't come here. Like, it opened the doors for me. It opened the doors for the multiple Indian, in India comics. China has comedy now because of this, right? The problem is that, uh, so, uh, what's his name? Uh, Russell Peters never evolved. He kept doing the same stereotypes yeah, and yeah. he kept doing that. That's that, troublesome. That's his shtick. Now, the thing is, he, <laughs> You and I can sit down here and discuss about this. Flo is still making millions. Easier said than yeah, done. He, yeah. He, look, yeah. he's, still, he's still coming to Malaysia next year. He's still going to sell out a stadium. He's still going to make a lot of money. He's still going to go back and he's going to cry at the bank. Right? <laughs> so we can talk about all the fact that, oh, the Flo never evolved, la, the Flo not funny, la, the Flo he's still going to make a lot of money and we're still going to sit and here and do a podcast. People will still pay for the ticket. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. It doesn't matter. Right? At the end of the day, hey, look, it's a business, you do what you think is right, right? So basically for me, I want to evolve. I want to evolve as a comic to do different things, to do, you know, to do, to be a bit more of a, they say, and I, I see my audience evolving with me. I really do. Like I, when I started, I remember doing all this racial, racial joke, you know, Malay is this, Chinese is this, Indian is this. Yeah. Like, you no, know. No, actually do that in a fall flat. No, anyway. now, now. A fall flat. It's not only fall flat, but also the fact that I feel like my audience want more yeah. than this. And also I travel a lot, so I can't do that anymore. Correct. Now I combine them to a Malaysian stereotype because all the stereotypes are, to be honest, they say what? Uh, Indian come late. Hey, Chinese people also come late. Yeah. Malay people also come late. Yeah, yeah. You know, oh, but they say uh, what? Uh, 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 Malay people lazy. Come on, like, Chinese people also lazy. I'm fucking lazy. Yeah, I'm so lazy, bro. <laughs> you, lazy. Know, <laughs> you know, you know, they say what? Uh, Chinese people stingy. Bro, have you met? <laughs> some Indian flirts Yeah, same word. thing. <laughs> Malay also same. It's, it's about being thrifty. It's a Malaysian yeah. stereotype. It's got yeah. nothing to do with your race anymore. So at the end of the day, you know, now I'm more of a Malaysian, hey, let's talk about the Malaysian stereotype, which I can easily travel with because now I can tell people, hey, this is the Malaysian stereotype. Malaysians are like this, right? And and also the fact that I want to talk about more deeper, meaningful things than this thing. And I see my, my audience evolving with that. Like the last special I did was up and down, up and down, right? I could see the audience accepting this as I didn't know I could feel like this in a comedy yeah, show. Yeah. Like, I, after that, you know, the social media people put reviews up. People just, you know, hey, great show. Duh. And I could I could feel people in, people write, uh, people were writing also. La, the fact that they were taken to a journey. Yeah. And they didn't know that they could go to a comedy, comedy show and not only feel laughter. They could feel so many other emotions as well. But if you do JB, KL, Penang, that's mm -hmm. fine. But if you do, like, say, Kamaman, okay would la. you do Kamaman? You mm. wouldn't do Kamaman, right? Or no, la, I mean... Or like, say, Bagan Sarai, right? No, the problem but, with... But then they wouldn't... So, it's not so like I don't want to do. Don't get me wrong. I would no audience love there, to do Kamaman. I mean, I'll do an audience of three people. La. 
Like if they pay thirty thousand each, lah, right? Yeah, lah. Maybe no. The problem, <laughs> the pro. I would look. I would do it for free. I honestly would. But the problem is there's no, there's no audience there. So like, would you sell? Would you sell? Would you sell? Would you open a shop, a iMac shop, in the middle of Kemaman? Okay, I get your point. But yeah. the thing is, there's still. It, it's not a broad-based thing. It's not a broad-based maturity. I'd like to think the whole country is getting smarter, you, more, you you know, also more knowledgeable. Yes. But look, look at what happened to the to Crack House, right? When, when Ben Gaze, you know that one, right? What yes, the yes. hell, man? No, right? So I mean, what happened there? Listen, that's got nothing to do with a comedy audience. That's got nothing to do with, uh, with sane people, to be honest. The people who are upset has never been and never will be going okay. to a comedy club. They have never seen a comedy show before in their life. They don't even understand what is comedy in Malaysia, and especially as I said, you 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 bring up Kemaman. If I was doing comedy in Malay, yeah, I would do a show in Kemaman. I'm sure there is shows yeah, of yeah. Uh, Malay comedy because that's the market there, right? We do more urban market because we speak English, right? It's an English speaking comedy, and I, the reason why I do English speaking and not Malay speaking is because I would like to travel, right? And I've done I've done Marajalawa. As well, I didn't do well, but I did yeah. it right. I I I put my hat out there already. Uh, but however, I I feel like uh, the crack house thing happened because of few people who basically wanted to latch on to something for their political gain, and it's one of those things where the people who who were upset, and we've we've tested this theory. The people who are upset has got nothing to do with. With this thing, it was just, it was just a bunch of people who basically wanted to be upset about something. Yeah, and it's very simple because both me and Rizal, okay, I mean obviously Rizal more than me, but we both got hate on social media. We both got, I got personal WhatsApps calls. People were calling me and saying, "Why you do this?" and stuff like that. I'm very sure Rizal had got worse. And but the thing is, both me and Rizal have been traveling since, and I went to, uh, you know, uh, Tioman. And I met people, mm. right? Who basically were like, "Hey, you need comedian, man." And I'm like, "Yeah." And they, they they sit down with me and they're like, "You know that whole thing?" Yeah. Nobody found it. Nobody was upset. Yeah. I mean, what that girl did, that was a whole different story, and it got nothing to do with nothing comedy. Nothing to do. Yeah. Nothing to do with comedy. Nothing to do with the club. Now, the thing was, people were outraged, and those people who are outraged has never been, never will be. And never, they will never go to a comedy show and enjoy it. So thankfully, they these guys would stay in the minority. But these minorities sometimes make the most noise. Yes. So that makes someone like you and your work a little bit more difficult, lah. Because yeah. do, do you know what I mean? Because artists have always encountered opposition to their ideas and to the way they deliver their art. That right? means you're doing the right thing, lah. Yeah. That in a way, right? Yeah. yeah. That means you're doing the right thing, yeah. lah. But no, here's the thing, though. I mean, it it's just weird, lah. I mean, we will. People want to get angry. They will get angry. About anything, anything lah. Like, anything yeah. lah. Like, you can, you can do the nice. You can sing that shit. Also, people will get upset with you lah. You know, you oh, you said the wrong word. You said the wrong pronunciation of things. Listen, like I remember there was once, uh, people were upset about, a book, that was in sejarah, and it was, it was something about the word paria in the book, right. And everybody got upset, so upset. They were writing letters. There was, uh, you know, in every magazine and newspaper, there were notes to the editor. There's a lot of people with a lot of time in their hands, lah. I mean, we we had out so of much. out of all people, zero people read the book. Yeah. None of exactly. them read the book. They just got fed up with that they one just, thing. They, yeah. It's just the one word paria in there. And when I read the book, I was like, ah, yeah, lah, correct, lah. That that was the correct word used at the correct time, and that's what they said. And then everybody was like, they lost their minds. Yeah. Nobody read the book. Yeah. Do you know what? Right. There, there's been this world is so full of these um, incidents that make so many people angry, but it's so small. Yeah. Like I had a friend who was traveling through the Middle East like 20 years ago, right? And uh, there was a little skirmish by the. He was in I think Iraq or Afghanistan or something, right? Mm. He was having breakfast in the market. You know, peaceful. Everybody's having fun, right? So there's a little skirmish over there. Mm. All the TV crews and the CNN was there, Al Jazeera was there, BBC was there. Oh, and then it was being beamed worldwide. Oh, okay. this is happening in Iraq. It's it's a mess. Oh, my friend is having his his breakfast. You know, it's a, nothing. So you don't realize how nice the country is yes. until you go there, right? Yeah. 
it's like same thing lah. This book maybe it's fantastically written. Nobody's read it. Yes. But one word, Paria. Oh, big fuss. Yeah, big fuss. And then social media amplifies it. Exactly. Like I, I remember there was this one video of this <coughs> old white man in Thailand, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, he got punched. I think I saw and that. And knocked out. I think I saw that. Everybody yeah. got upset. Everybody yeah. was like murder. He, this man who punched the old man got death threats yeah. right and basically everybody was like, how dare you punch an old man blah 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 and then someone shared a different perspective of the video before what happened mm. this old man was apparently he was drunk mm. hit the uh, had an accident with this uh, Thai man and then uh, basically came out with a sword oh, shit. and threatened to kill that man and then eventually this Thai man lost patience and just whack and the player <coughs> fell down. Right? So you what you don't because the and but the problem was damage done already. This fellow <coughs> was being blamed for something that he did, but he was provoked. Now when they saw the whole video, everybody was like, Oh, okay, that makes sense. Right? Because now you understand where this fellow is coming from. Because if someone threatens you with a knife, you also have to defend yourself. So it's like what you say, lah. Right, people are maturing, which is a good thing. Yeah. So in the past, people would be like, um, they would get all emotional about the what happened, mm. or what happened was this guy got hit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But now they, but now people are asking why that happened to result in the what. But not it, enough. Not enough. Not enough. Not no, enough. it's it's like this war in Ukraine, right? Everybody mm. says, oh, Putin is a bad man. That's what happened. Putin did it, attack the Ukraine, but why? Nobody talks about the past twenty years, the past thirty years. The NATO thing and the stuff NATO like thing that. and the. I still don't agree that. with it. Don't get me no, wrong. No, yeah, but you understand there's never it. anything which 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 uh, allows a country to evade. Yeah. But there's a certain point that limits to why to what people can accept and what they can't. And beyond that, that's why the what happens ah. Yeah. It's like this guy that get drunk and he threatens this guy with a. Of course, the Thai guy is gonna react. Yeah, la. exactly. I mean, what the hell, man? I mean, you like for mean? instance, like if you if you look at you you like when you said lah, you know, people people are asking why not enough though because there is social media has amplified a lot of voices. Right, and the problem is the loudest voice is either extreme right or extreme left. Yeah, the most strident. These these are the loudest voices. The silent majority will never make never noise. Never make noise, right? And and here's the thing: the the extreme left has always been the the best at social media. Yeah. Right, because they use social media to cancel people, to do this, to do that, and to spread a bit. Sometimes good, sometimes can you all calm down? Right, <laughs> exactly. Right, it'll come down. <laughs> uh, like you know, there's sometimes like you know, oh, you can't use the word quick. I'm like, yeah, yeah, please, okay. The like, world is getting weirder, yeah, yeah. Weirder, man. Oh, you cannot have you know the word man anywhere. I'm like, hey, please, yeah, uh, you know. So, so I, I, so I want to ask you, right? Mm. Actually, you, you're a bit of an anomaly because you're a comedian. You're a very social creature. You're obviously very good at, at winning crowds over, right? Uh, okay. But you don't like people. And I agree because, yeah. yeah <laughs> you know, because people are weird, right? Yeah. And they're getting weirder and weirder okay. by the year. I have to explain that. It's not that I don't like people. No, so, sorry. I, yeah. I probably <laughs> just quoted you. Don't no, make me sound no, no, like no, no. this anti-social <laughs> no, 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 in, in a cave somewhere. Okay. <laughs> I don't like people. <laughs> as an older guy, as an older guy, right? I understand. People are they're full of their pattern, like, yeah, all kinds of colours and stuff, right? Yeah. And to me now, I choose my interactions. I, mm. I choose my meetings. I choose my the people I'm, I'm with. Because people are very tiring and stressful to me. Yeah. Right? You know? No, and, and there is a reason for this because I am socially awkward and I have social anxiety. It's very difficult for me to talk to people who I just met. But I, here, if you, here we are. Okay. We've just met. You see, this is a character I'm playing, right? I, I know how to work the camera. I know how to be a sociable yeah, person. I understand. I don't know if you noticed this, but when I first met you downstairs, yeah, yeah. it was very hard for me to make eye contact with you. Right? And that is That's not... the ADHD thing. Yeah, it's not only the ADHD thing, but it was also for me that I, I, I have to put effort yeah. into a social interaction. Yeah. And it, honestly, I can tell you, it makes me very tired at the end. Yeah. Right? And can you imagine like... Hey, thanks for doing this. No, no, bro, bro. bro. <laughs> uh, you'll get my bill. But, <laughs> but no, but you see, like for instance, for me, doing this is, is, is a job for me. It's, it's, it's you know... Yeah. It, it builds a profile, right? Yeah. It's sh- uh, no, no, no. yeah. But just imagine after a show, right, I have to meet hundreds of people. Dude, that's so tiring, man. Yeah. It, for me, I just did a show. That's yeah. in, in itself tiring. After that, I have to kind of... So it, it's very it's very emotionally draining for me to do this, and and sometimes 
it, and you have to be correct that character. social yeah. Yeah. you have to be social i mean you have to be nice to people yeah. and i i don't want to be nice to people it's not yeah. i i i've got i i don't want to be mean to people i really yeah. don't i i i i i i genuinely cherish and and thankful that you bought tickets to my show and i yeah. love you for it yeah. but you know the thing is like sometimes after a show i i you know i love people coming up to me and telling me stories as well because i as i was telling you earlier you make this one way connection with the audience because as you're telling your personal stories the audience connects with you right they they are feeling this connection because you are telling them a personal story yeah. you are confiding in them and they make this connection you however are not making a connection at all to anybody yeah. right because it's it's an audience it's it's a, yeah. uh, it's one, a one living street, entity though. right so yeah it's a one way street so basically after the show they'll come up to you and be like oh you know i love the show and this thing that thing i will tell you about a story about my grandmother <laughs> and you're like oh my god can you please <laughs> i cannot take this right now yeah. and, and, and the worst you. thing they will do is after that, oh you can use that story I'm like yes. Yeah, okay, That's exactly <laughs> what I need right now. A story about my Chinese grandmother. <laughs> <laughs> Is it true that um comics are, are quite troubled individuals? I mean like Robin Williams, right? Mm. So funny, but so troubled, right? Yes. Um who else? So so many others I can't yeah, So many, yeah. So many, it's right? it's weird. Like, I mean I I don't this thing is com- comedians. I think it's performance in general. Co- yeah, performance, right? I think uh now especially with this age modern age right yeah. it's is just we're just so much more out there and like uh like the guy from Linkin Park Chester Bennington yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. and stuff like that we struggle I I mean I've been through depression a few times in my life especially after I became a comedian because there is a need for you to kind of fake your emotions yeah. and i said and as i said it's very Correct. emotionally draining Correct. and stuff like that and for you to feel what you feel is very hormonal is it at all possible to be as real as possible and just no be no real? we genuinely we genuinely feel the feelings we feel yeah. don't get me wrong but the problem is but the the persona is a little bit of an artifice isn't it right? I, yes it is but also the fact that you have to understand that depression is nothing to do with how you feel It's yeah. very hormonal. It's a clinical thing. Yeah. You feel sad, you don't know why don't you know feel why. sad. Yeah. And I I mean obviously, you know, based on psychiatrists and 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 psychologists, you 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 know for a fact that it's very hormonal. So with comedians and performers what we do is we fake happiness so much that our body seems to think we don't need the happiness hormone anymore. Mm. Dopamine and serotonin just drops. Yeah. And the problem with that is we don't get unless we're on stage, mm. we're not getting this that dopamine, dopamine fix, yeah. yeah, fix. So basically on stage we are fine. When we get off stage that's when it dips. Yeah, yeah. And that's what happens to us and basically we just have this thing. You know, and people expect you to be yeah, funny all the time. Yeah. And then the worst part is people get then find the bottle or find drugs and yeah. that's how they get Yeah. And then they become the Robin Williams, yes, right? Yes. And it because he was I mean the alcohol and the drugs and you know uh, there's so many others uh, that you know basically fell into this trap of yeah. alcohol, drugs and stuff yeah. like I thank God I mean you know I can come out of this. Yeah. Yeah. You know I don't drink anymore. I yeah. definitely don't take drugs. Yeah. as much but still <laughs> no lie, I don't Coffee. but yeah. you know it's it's very easy yeah. Do, I, um, I, 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 I can tell you yeah. because all we want is dopamine we, yeah. are, we, we are not we, I can tell you a lot of people who are alcoholics and, and, and drug addicts they're not they're not alcohol and drug addicts yeah. they're dopamine addicts and yeah. they, all they want is just to feel normal yeah. and that's the only way they can and it be, the worst part is with alcohol and drugs is because you know it brings you even worse down yeah right it drags you even further and then it just ma- it brings you to a whole different level uh. there's a lot of level headed level heads out there but there also there's also a lot who are not yeah yeah right. what about exercise and working out and you know just the natural fix because you know obviously you, you you're you talking the wrong guy uh. Yeah, I know, but do but but there's a real no, no, natural I mean, solution there, you know. Like it is, it is, of course. Sunshine and yeah, but I mean, I I love playing futsal. That's my thing. That's yeah. my my enjoyment. Right. Yeah. Like this is. I hate going to the gym because I feel. No, like, you don't have to go gym. You just go and work out. Just go for a walk. Or, I know. I I, I do walk sometimes yeah. and like swim. I love swimming. I love water. 
Uh, but for me, futsal is the 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 thing lah. The thing lah, because it's a more social this thing. I, I I'll tell you why I don't like gym. Okay, I know I know a lot of people out there go to, go to the gym. Ah, it's yeah, how can I you say it's gym, not? No, no, I, I hate, hate gyms, gym I hate because gyms. I feel inadequate. I feel so inadequate when I go to a gym because this guy is working out and I'm just basically bench pressing a bar, I, like I, without I, even the weights. I I don't care about other people, but what no, I don't I know. like is is the fact that it's it's artificial air. Yes, and you're confined okay. to these walls. That one that one also I can deal with. I ca- I can't deal with the fact that I feel judged in a gym because everyone there. La. No, I know you. Can, it's very easy for you to say, oh screw these people, don't care about them. Yeah. I do. I feel judged. Now I feel like I am inadequate, especially a a, a fat. Mm. Person, mm. right, going to a gym and seeing all those gym bros doing, you know, mm. ah, ah. yeah. I don't go to the gym specifically because I don't like gym bros. Yes, and like, and I, hell, f- man? I look at them and I feel inadequate because I feel like this is not what they're doing. Yeah. It is not them. It's hundred yeah. percent me. It's it's all here. It's all here. It's all here, right? Yeah. That I feel like, oh, you know, what's the point? Yeah, I'm not going to get there. Mm. And basically, what am I doing? Yeah. I feel like I I feel so out of place. That's why I hate the gym. Yeah. It's like people tell me go to the gym. Oh, you know we'll give you free gym membership. I say I don't want. <laughs> I don't want. Like there's there's no there's no reason for me to go to the gym and feel like if you know how emotionally draining for me to go through that whole process of being in the gym and being so self conscious of myself yeah. while exercising that yeah. maybe I can do the treadmill ten minutes. Yeah. Then I see someone next to me doing it for thirty minutes and yeah. I feel like. Fucker. Like not enough, yeah. like, and then I give up. I I go home and I go like ah screw it lah. I'll have yeah. a sandwich. Yeah. Right. What's the point? Yeah. So for me, like yes, that that is one thing. <laughs> for some people, look, things work differently for different people, right? Uh, it's all about the person, and I think do what makes you happy. If yeah. going to the gym makes you happy, great. Exactly. If exactly. going, if if doing. Uh, you know, if doing crossword puzzles is your thing, hey, go do it. I just found solitaire to be my thing. Yeah, I love solitaire. As as a person with ADHD and dyslexia, solitaire helps me. It immerses you, right? It immerses. It gives me that whole that you see. Just I I realized this right. Just before going on stage, I I do a speed round of solitaire. Yeah. yeah. Right. Basically, just speed, speed, speed. Wow, two minutes. Okay. Two minute games, and I realized that my focus after that is just boom. Like wow, so nice, ah. Yeah. Right, so hey, if it makes you happy, makes you ha- it makes Actually, you do whatever. Because, Horse riding, yeah. Right, even if even if like what, you know, naked dancing, whatever you want to do, it make you happy, make you happy. Yeah, yeah. Um, actually, it's interesting to say that because um, a lot of successful people are ADHD people. I think Steve Jobs was ADHD. Yes. And he was very very Actually, focused on everybody got ADHD. <laughs> That's a problem. It's it's quite common. Yeah. Like. More, but except that in my time. It wasn't recognized as such. A oh no, no, no! Would, it just got beaten out of them. But today, there's all kinds of treatment and psychotherapy. Yeah, don't get me wrong. I had dyslexia and ADHD. Ah, uh. it's a co- to my parents. I was just too peed. Yeah, and people don't realize in those days. Yes. I hear he's like that one kind one, right? Ah, one kind. Uh. Like Elon Musk is ADHD, and yes. dude, he can deep dive into something so deep he can find a solution to like I don't know climate change and yes. whatever, right? But he cannot find a solution for Twitter, lah. Whatever yeah. people say. <laughs> Not yet, though. <laughs> but that's the thing. So today, like kids. A diagnosed ADHD is very common. Like one yeah. every ten kids, you know. Um, yeah. No, I can see my daughter. My daughter has ADHD. You got hundred percent. I don't need a doctor to tell me. Really. Yeah. So you know, it's it's one of those things where I know she's she's very easily distracted yeah. by things and yeah. stuff like that. And it, she's hyper hyper hyperactive as well, which is yeah. it's fine for me, yeah. right? You know, I I know how to deal with it. You know, just let it be. But as I said, lah, you know, it's it, last time it was just oh, I just, I was it, I was just stupid, lah. Yeah, you know, yeah, it's, it's, yeah. I swear to God, like when I got diagnosed with dyslexia, when, that's when were you? When were you diagnosed? Fifteen. I was okay, not that's diagnosed. Quite old already, really, yeah, yeah, I was not diagnosed. Diagnosed, right? I was not like a doctor came and said this man has dyslexia. No, <laughs> that's not what happened. A teacher understood that I had a saw the spectrum disability, and basically, uh, so I I was in one school. I got kicked out of uh, that school. And went to another school, which is supposed to be much lower profile, right? This school did not; they just thought I was stupid and naughty, right? They kicked me out of the school, and then I came to this school, and then the the English teacher actually, uh, Miss Helen, she was the one who basically came and said, "I think there's an issue with your reading," because when she saw my handwriting, she saw that my 
alphabets were the thing. And Chambu she said, I think there's yeah. a problem. And then she gave me cue cards to read. Right? That's when I learned how to read through images. Ah. Right? And that's when I started. <coughs> I went from a D student to a straight A student. Shit. Almost in three months. Wow. So, from from like as a D student to PMR, I got straight A's. As Whoa. PM, I got like pretty good grades, and I got a scholarship to by Petronas to go to UK to study. Bloody hell, man! Yeah, so basically, Shit, in Petronas if, scholar, so man. can you imagine from standard one to standard two, from two, nobody gives a shit about me because I was just stupid. And then I went, like my life changed, like three sixty, and my parents, my parents, uh, until today they thought I copied so, my SPM. So what was the game changer there? It's basically learning how to read and uh, having to understand. Can you imagine? Your whole life, you are trying to be better. You know, you know, you know the answer, but you cannot write. Mm. You get what I'm saying? Mm. Like, you know the answer, but you cannot concentrate. You know the answer, but you cannot... You, you want to write an essay, mm. but every time you write an essay, everything is wrong. And you are frustrated. And you feel like you don't want to give it. You don't want to give effort anymore. Really. You give effort also, you will fail. You don't give effort also, you fail. Might as well don't give effort and fail. Mm. It's much easier, right? Yeah. Right. Like I remember, I I started smoking very young. Okay, I started smoking when I was like fourteen. Mm. Right. And the reason why I started smoking, stress. Ah. No, because my father accused me of smoking. My father accused me of smoking when I was fourteen, and I did not smoke. I got, I, obviously, I got punished and beaten for it. And then I thought to myself, if they're going to scold me and beat me for smoking, I might as well smoke. <sighs> right. So that's what happened. I got beaten as for smoking when I didn't smoke. I went outside. I bought a packet of cigarettes. Smoked. Fucking hell, man. Right. So that th- that's why I said I always find the easy way out. Yeah. Like for instance, when I when I when I I was I was failing anyway. If I didn't put effort or not, might as well I do it the easy way. I don't put effort. On. And that's when suddenly I realized that if I can do this whole reading through images thing, yeah, and I can apply that. It was very easy for me to apply because one thing I had with ADHD and dyslexia was a memory, because my memory was very good, which is why again I can do comedy and, yeah, and one hour and a half. Yeah. yeah, everything is there. It's is 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 very systematic, so I can do that. Now suddenly, I am scoring A's. Now suddenly I write an essay. The teacher said write three hundred fifty word essay. I'm writing five hundred six hundred words. So, so if you were to um, verbalize what was the game-changing element there, what would it be? Just basically learning to read and and having a gratification for my effort. Okay, that gratification comes later, lah. But learning to read, as in, like in the past, you just see a bunch of words, right? Yeah. Then they fall over each other, right? But now yeah. you're using image cards, is it? Yes, basically. Okay, how dyslexia works is basically your your brain processes information as a whole. But your eyes is pro- uh, processing information as single letter. Mm. When you read, like let's say when you read this more, what you reading is M O R E, right? Yeah. So yeah. that makes more. Yeah. What I see is the whole image of more. So do I though. Like no, but you you. I understand. Okay, I understand. No. Yeah. So so then you've got to repurpose the the reading material yes. with image cards. Which image? If you don't cards. have that, then no. How? You have to look at things different way. Like, you, you, I don't see M as an alphabet anymore. I see M as a shape. Okay. Right. It's it's just a repurposing of your brain. It takes a while to get used to, but eventually you kind of everything. It's it's focus ah. Mm. Is you are focusing on different things rather than the word itself. Like usually you would, like you if you want to spell out a word, right? For me, you have to alphabet. And whenever I see a new word that I've never seen before, it becomes a bit weird. Yeah. And then slowly I will process it, and then it becomes a word for me that I can remember already. Right. Like like there's a lot of times when I see a word, like especially when I read in a foreign language or something, and I see the word and I'm like, oh my god, what does it say? Mm. Or sometimes when I'm reading, right? When I'm doing MC or or reading work. Especially on radio, sometimes I have to read live liners yeah. and stuff, right? And I'm reading, 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 and the word is there, but what I see is a whole different word, <laughs> <laughs> right? Like substantial, yeah. right? So suddenly I'll be like, uh, with a, 
substandard this is this, and then people come up to me like you know you, this is substantial not substandard and then i'll go back and then i'll process oh yeah <laughs> <laughs> for me i have not made a mistake that is the word i saw yeah right yeah. so that's how it because you've seen it visualized as that yes. word yeah So yeah. basically, I'm I'm processing the word as a whole, not as individual letters. Yeah. So people will say substantial. Yeah. Right. I would see the whole thing, <laughs> but because I've never let's say lah, I've never seen the word substantial as an image before. So my brain will just process it as substandard. <laughs> as another word that is similar. Yeah. yeah. Right. So basically, that's what I see. And sometimes it it be funny lah, like you know when you see words. In signboards and stuff like that, you're like, oh my god! Oh, then you then you read properly. Ah, okay, okay. <laughs> so how does humor evolve from here f- for you? I mean, what's the second stage for you? I, the third stage. I do. I mean, I, I I travel a lot doing comedy, which is nice. I mean, I guess doing I'll be doing radio uh, next in 2023. Fly, Fly FM, yeah. 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 Full time or what? Full time. Oh, yeah. You so, mean? Um, cannot tell yet, lah. Yeah. Okay, cannot tell yet. Okay. But yes. Uh, so. It's going to be a full-time job, and it's going to be very difficult for me to. Do it morning then, or you? Yeah, uh, you gotta wake up lah. The if if morning lah. Morning lah. La. If morning. I'll be looking forward to it. If, if, I I literally tune in the morning mm-hmm. when I'm driving my kid to school mm-hmm. to listen to you. Oh, okay. Which is why I called you actually. Thank you. Yeah, thank yeah. you. No, yeah. I mean it's it's one of those things. I, I thought you good. You're very natural guy. Yeah. The I, way you just reel off is like from the heart, you know. To me, comedy is always from the heart. Yes, yeah. and that's that's why I cannot write. Yeah. If I write, I I feel it's coming from somewhere yeah. else. Yeah. From the brain, yeah, right? Yeah. When I when I talk, I'm not thinking about yeah. what I'm speaking. I'm just yeah. Yeah, words just come out of my mouth, and it's I I I like that. I like the fact that we can we can do silly things. A lot of people don't realize that when you have com- comics on air on live radio in the morning, it is as close to being in person as is possible. Mm-hmm. Because when you talk off the cuff, it's straight from you. Yeah. There's no producers. There's no editor. And then straight there's away no to writer. the microphone. There's no writer. From microphone, pop. Seven seconds later, because there's a lag, right? Yeah, it's in my ear already, and I'm. Yeah. Oh, this is the dude. This is what he's all about. Yeah. So, yeah, a lot of people don't realize that radio in the morning. It's not about the, the news or the content. It's about the person. You're buying into the person. Yeah. Which is why, for me, in the early '90s, right, like you know, I think late '90s, for me, it was Fly and Kev. Uh, I, yeah. I love Fly and Kev. Those right? guys, yeah. Fantastic. And today, yeah. like I will see Kev. Real, they're real guys. Yeah. No, no, no. no I, I worked with Kevin Red FM last yeah, time. Yeah, right. Yeah, what are my favorite? Till today, till today. Yeah, Fly what, what are my favorite yeah. persons? Even Fly Guy also was there. Yeah, Fly. Yeah, so uh, Fly Guy was fantastic. Such a that, yeah, he's such an inspiration. Like I, I, I remember listening to those two and they were doing silly so, things. Yeah, just silly, silly and, things. Yeah, that, exactly. You know, so entertaining. And you know, it's them. It's yeah, them. Yeah, yeah. Isn't really them. Yeah. You know, no, no bullshit. No accent. Don't put on this bloody Amal yeah, yeah. Masali accent. Nah, nah. Although Fly did have a little bit of a Masali American accent, but you can't get it. Yeah, lah. You know, but he because yeah, he yeah, 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 yeah. But Kev was like totally yeah, different. Yeah, yeah. Right? Kev was like, well, what are you, what are you, why are you talking like that? But no, no. I mean, yeah, it's it's a lot of fun, lah. I mean, a lot of people don't realize that. Radio and comedy is two very different things. Yeah. It's a lot well, of radio is just a channel. Com- yeah. Comedy is like when you do comedy, when you do stand up, right? And you're an aud- live audience. That's why I love live. live yes. comedy. it's you and him, and that's it. It's, yeah. it's just no. There's it's, no filter. It's it's so it's so hard to explain to people how different the 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 art is. It's a very different hat you have to yeah, wear. Yeah. It's a very different skill. That's why a lot of comedians want to do radio and fail. Want to do and fail? No, they have done and, and failed. Fail. Yes, like I think uh, the only I think if Harith does radio, he wouldn't do so well. Actually, actually that's that, my gut that feel. That is a that's a proven fact. Yeah, actually, because he did. He do, was on radio, was he? He he did try out, and then people didn't. He, he, yeah, he, because in again, person, personalities are very different. In person, actually, Harith is a bit like. Yeah, he's a bit standoffish. He's a bit aloof, right? Yeah, but yeah. He, yeah, and the thing is, that's the person he is. And on stage, we always play a character. The character is ourselves, but it's an amplification of our that's own personality, right. and right. it it's different off stage and on stage. And for me, I I've learned to play this different hats. Like I've been on radio before in 2015, uh, and I, I I learned how to do it. Uh, Papi Zak, who was my radio partner at that time, yeah. has already done uh, Light FM before that. Yeah. And he's already learned that hat, so he he basically you know taught me how to be this radio person rather than this comedian person. Yeah. Because remember, on 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 as a comedian, you get gratification 
instantly. instantly. Yeah. Whereas in radio, you'd never get gratification. And you just, just yeah, you, it, maybe the fellow laugh, maybe the fellow don't laugh. Yeah. Right? You don't know. Yeah. And you're basically entertaining yourselves. And yeah. basically, and, and, and you have to wear a different hat because now, are you, are you more subversive or are you more dominant? Yeah. Right? You have to play the different roles as well. And because in my podcast, I am more sub... Submissive. I, I'm more submissive. Yeah. Uh, Kiran Balan. Kiran, Kiran, yeah, Kiran is Kiran. the more dominant one yeah. there. But so however, he's yeah. But however, <laughs> yeah, little bit lah. I, I yes, I'm the little yeah, spoon. A missionary, yeah. Yes. Uh, but no. But you, you know. But I also play the dominant one in other parts of my. This is like radio. Sometimes I play the dominant. Sometimes yeah. I play the sub. Yeah. So it, you, you have to kind of wear different hats, and sometimes you have to just play the idiot and at the side. And some Indians can't do that. Right? Yes. Um, and so, so, yeah, yeah, exactly. It's very difficult to for you to, yeah. to to work because comedian. You have to understand. We are alone. We are the mic. We are control. It's very hard for a comedian to give out control, especially during performance. Mm. It's very difficult. Like me and Zach, we do a, we do a show called Puppy and Grumpy. It's both of us on stage at the same time, right? And we kind of improv our way through. Yeah. And the only way that works is because I play a <coughs> dominant role. I play a more dominant role where Zach is more laid back, more relaxed. So then he can, you know, not he's not submissive, but yeah. it's more towards a a support role. Yeah. Right. So, so I have foil, to yes. Right? So I have to I have to <coughs> kind of lead dominant, but with the Macha Man podcast, it's the other way around. Yeah. Right. So now I have to learn how to play this role now, and it, it, you see the thing is I I. I, I am proud of myself for being able to wear these hats yeah. and to be able to learn how to do different skills at different times. And these are abilities. It is, yeah. yes. Yeah. It, it's, that's why it, for, for comic, it's, it's very hard for them to do a two-man show yeah. because it's very hard for them to give up control. And, yeah. it's, and it's very hard for them to give up. Like the one thing I learned very importantly is to let people have their moment. Yeah. And for comic, uh, especially to make people laugh, very hard, no, to give out that they say. Yeah. Just imagine, right? If you had a joke right now, yeah. right, yeah. and it, the best joke, everybody clap already. Yeah, yeah. For me, my instinct is I need to one up. Yeah. I need to one up. Okay. okay. But having not to do that is yeah. a skill that is hardest to learn, especially for a comic. Yeah, yeah. Like you know, if you have the laugh, let you have it. Yeah. It's your time. Yeah, yeah. Right. For me to, to give you that moment, every comic will want to say, "Oh no, I got a better joke than that," but don't. Don't just relax. Let you have your moment because the win is not just you; it's both yeah, of us also. Yeah, yeah. Like it's like a World Cup lah. You yeah. know, Ronaldo play, don't play ah. Portugal win the World Cup, he still win. Correct. Yeah. Correct. So, okay, I'm not going to keep you too much longer, but um, just want to get in the head in terms of what's next for you lah. Because okay. I think you're one of those few comics in Malaysia that can transcend, and you're doing it already. Like yeah. I believe. Yes. Yes. With your brand of humor, right? With your ability to to evolve. Your ability to, to cross platforms, um, I think that's a real skill. I, I, yeah. I mean, yeah, I, I, I'm quite proud of it. Yeah. I, yeah. I have to say, I'm blowing my own horn a little bit, but you know. If you don't, don't blow your own horn, who's going to blow Who's going to blow my horn, right? Yeah. Uh, Sometimes you've got to blow yourself. Like, yeah, I, mean, I know. Yeah. Nobody wants to blow me. So anyway, <laughs> coming back, I mean, what's next? I think, uh, as we spoke about radio, is one thing that I'm doing. Uh, I am working on a new special as well. I, I look. I'm not going to tell you it's going to be on Netflix or whatever. Nobody knows. Special is a special. Special is a special. special. special I will record it. I will record it. It will be somewhere. If worst come to worst, it'll be free on YouTube. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, you know, look out for that. Look out for my shows. I I'm doing a lot more. I I can't travel as much. Maybe probably. So I'm I'm focusing more on yeah. doing Domestic, it here yeah. in Malaysia and you know kind of just. Working that that crowd, I I do a lot of crowd work shows now, yeah. which I love doing. Yeah. Just interplay, right? Yes, just interplay. So yeah. basically, I have zero. Z, I have zero material. Yeah, yeah. I you go just on stage go in there, and you just see and what just the talk. fuck happens. Yeah. yeah. So basically, I go on stage and I and I basically talk to an audience, and together with the audience, we come up with material. Yeah. We come up with moments, and it's I've done it three or four times now. And every it's a lot si- of fun, right? Every single show is magic. Yeah. It's just magic. It's just, it's just how this, the, the audience kind of feed me. And sometimes they think it's a very boring thing, like I'm a pilot. And from a pilot, I can just do half an hour on, like, yeah. you know, basically like how pilots are. Like, I, I remember there was this one time, 
like basically that lah. So what you do? You're a pilot. Oh, so you drive planes. And I accidentally said drive. Yeah. And from there, I just went like, okay, not drive, but you know, yeah. can you imagine if you yeah. drive like, hey, just, <laughs> yeah. your hand outside, like just, yeah, yeah. <laughs> hey, <laughs> you know, just 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 doing that on a plane, yeah, just yeah. like, hey, hey, what's up, <laughs> like you know, just parking like, <laughs> <laughs> like you know, can you imagine like you know, but then he he flew Air Asia lah, so cannot. Uh, <laughs> So yeah, I'm, you know, I'm, that yeah. kind of stuff. Like, and it's it's just sometimes it's just magic, and I, I always try to be very respectful to the audience because, yeah. as I said, we're partners in this. We it's not it's not about oh I will come there and just insult you. Actually, That's not yeah. the way. And I'm I'm amazed at what some comics in America get away with. Like, yes. Oh my god. No, you see, like Russell Peters can oh get away with god. it. Oh my god! Yeah. Russell Peters can like get going because, down and having a glass of water and some and there's chili and oh my god. Yeah. yeah. No, know? because you see, Russell Peters can get away with it because the audience wants to get roasted by him, yeah. right? Now crowd work shows. And that's why they sit in front. Yeah. Oh my god! My wife will never sit in front. You see, for me, a crowd work show is not about roasting you, right? It's nothing to do with roasting. It's nothing to do with you. It's together. We are doing yeah. this together. Yeah. You give you give me the lines. You set them up. I hit I hit them up. Right. <laughs> so basically, that's what we're doing. And yeah. and the thing is, I try to be as respectful as possible. And uh, like you know, I don't. I I try to not to make fun of names. If you have a weird name, yeah. we'll talk about it. Dude, oh right? my god, American comics all the time. Yeah. Oh my god, so bad, so yeah. racist sometimes. But yeah, they they love it and they love like. It I up. I remember there was this one time where I was doing a crowd work show and this guy was named. Like Gary Crimson, that Crimson was his last name, right? And I, I swear to God, half an hour was was me like I want that name. That is the best name I've ever Crimson, heard yeah, in my exactly, entire life. That exactly. sounds like a superhero. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That sounds like accountant by day, but Crimson by night. Like just you know, for me, yeah. it's just like it, and he was laughing the whole time. Yeah. Like I, I did, I, I wasn't making fun of his name. I was just like, how cool is that exactly, name? Exactly. Right. You exactly. know, it's empowering rather than you know this thing. Yeah, yeah. And I like doing that. I like doing that with the audience. Though I think the only time I laughed at something with the audience was at the audience. <laughs> at the audience member was then there was this one time uh, we were like, where? What do you do for a living? Yeah. And he said he's a chef. Yeah. And I said where? He said boost juice. Oh shit! I'm like, dude, oh, that's, that's not a chef. Like, oh shit! Well, depends on how permissive. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Are. I'm like, no, and I, we, I laugh for half an hour. I, I, the whole crowd was laughing, and the wife just went like, no, they have a kitchen. Yes, it's a blender. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and it was very funny, lah. But at the end, so always go visual, up to the, yeah, yeah, always go up to him and like, you know, dude, thank you for being such yeah. a sport. But you understand that that was yeah, the funniest thing that, ever. Yeah. and he also was like, don't worry, lah. Actually, he, he wasn't a chef at Boost Juice. He was just like. A chef at a cafe that is owned by Boost Juice, and it just came out that way. It just right? came out that yeah. way, and it was funny. It was hilarious. And he also enjoyed himself, so it's yeah. And humor is so important today, right? Because there's yeah. so much shit to get fretful about. Exactly. That if we don't have humor and we if we don't laugh at ourselves, then bloody hell, life is yeah. miserable, man. Exactly. So society needs you. Oh, thank you. I certainly need you. I mean, okay. MCO. All I did was watch com- comics. I'm serious. Yeah. Like, because, you know, otherwise if you go and look on the other side and spend time on the, on the dark side, oh my God, there's so much to get exactly, depressed yeah. about, you know? Yeah. So, so, so thank you for doing this. Thank you so thank much Thank you for doing me. the show. And keep on doing what you do, man. Thank you for having me, man. Yeah. It's, it's been fun. It's been fantastic. Cheers. Oh, I pulled my muscle. <laughs> <laughs>